Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. This is the time of year that common loons are nesting with their young. As a result, wildlife officials are reminding all of us to stay 300 feet or more away from loon nesting in nursery areas. Loons have made a dramatic recovery in Vermont over the past 30 years. In 1987, the birds were on the state's endangered list. But thanks to the Loon Conservation Project, the birds have a secure future. Rebecca Gollin tells us more. Uh, right now we're hearing a bird here, it's a spotted sandpiper. A lot of birding we do, we do by ear. The call of a loon is unmistakable. It's very familiar to anyone who visits Vermont's larger lakes. You become so used to them and listening to them, you can tell the difference in their call and they have quite a personality. Linda and Bob Tucker spend a lot of their time on the water. The Ludlow couple are avid kayakers and regularly visit a number of the lakes in southern and central Vermont. They enjoy the exercise, but are usually paddling with a purpose. He's actually the loon ranger and I'm his assistant. <laughs> so yes, I go, I go when I'm needed to different places and he gets me into positions that are really strange, like swimming across the lake to get an egg out of a nest because he can't get close enough with the kayak. You know, that, that sort of thing is, my job. The Tuckers were recruited by friends to volunteer for the Vermont Loon Conservation Project about 20 years ago. We had seen loons, heard loons, as we ran around Lake Echo in Vermont. We didn't really know what, we were always asking, what is that? And finally we saw some. Loons return to Vermont from the New England coast at the end of winter. They start nesting from May to mid-June. The birds are easy to find and watch because of their distinctive black and white coloring and because they spend most of their time on the water. And we watch them through the summer until they learn to fly and right up until they uh, leave just before ice. I've been out when there's ice around Lake Nineveh and out there with them and the little ones are still there, the parents have left. The little ones leave the, at the end, just before ice sets in. They seem to know because it's only a couple days and there's ice. So, so I've watched them from the beginning to the end. When the Tuckers got involved in the project, the loon population in the state was facing a crisis. They were put on the state endangered species list. Throughout the 80s and early 90s, they were trying to figure out, okay, where's the bigger problem? We put out these nest warning signs to <clears throat> attempt to try to give this island a little bit of space where the loons would, would nest. Eric Hansen um, knows loons. To it takes about a month of incubation. Both male and female share in everything, um, whether it's nesting, chick rearing, feeding the chick, doing everything. It's, their behaviors are pretty much identical as far as the amount of time spent. When the chicks hatch, they can actually swim within hours. They leave the nest right away. They're done with the nest pretty much for the rest of the summer. That chick may not touch land until it breeds, which on average is a seven-year-old loon. So seven years of just being on the water or in the air. Hanson is the project coordinator for the Vermont Loon Conservation Project, which is part of the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, or VCE. The effort started in the late 1970s when scientists realized that the number of loons nesting in the state had dropped dramatically. So in 1983, there were only um, seven pairs that nested in the entire state and maybe another five pairs that were around. And they only counted uh, 29 adult loons that, that year, going statewide to most of the larger lakes. And they realized, you know, there's something going on. So in um, 1987, they were put on the state endangered species list. At that time, Scientists took a look at the remaining loons and their habitats to figure out what had caused the drastic decline and what could be done to turn it around. One piece of the puzzle was identifying certain types of lead fishing lures as poisonous to the birds and getting those banned. Another important piece was to protect the areas where loons build their nests. And one of the bigger issues that came up, or obvious issues, especially one that we could have an effect, was at the nesting site. They're very prone to disturbance. Um, they don't walk on land, so if something comes near them, they want to get into the water. They feel safe in the water, but they don't really feel safe sitting there. 
um, whether that's a human um, on shore, whether it's a boater. Um, so trying to protect some of the, the sites that are on busier lakes. Uh, another place was places like this, reservoirs that go up and down with hydro operation. Um, is there anything hydro companies could do to stabilize water? Uh, loons are only nesting oh, just an inch to four or five inches off the water, you know, somewhere in there. Sometimes it can be a foot, but it doesn't take much for water to go to, up and flood a nest. On islands where the birds just can't seem to get uh, a purchase, you know, a successful purchase for whatever reason, we'll use um, artificial islands. We call them platforms or rafts which are just really cedar logs with a wire mesh and we vegetate them and the loons will use those for nesting and those are great because they float up and down with the water. VCE Executive Director Chris Rimmer says that the expanding loon population can lead to issues that are both good and bad. As the population increases, which it is annually now, um, there are more and more um, loons coming back looking for new territories, looking for mates, and some of these birds are actually creating problems for the existing pairs. So a male, mm -hmm. for instance, might come into a territory of an existing pair and try to evict the resident male. And there can be some really severe skirmishes, I would call them battles. Now it's a good sign because it means there's a lot of loons and we've done well and they're increasing, but we've seen some territorial takeovers. We've also seen some battles mm -hmm. that have resulted in injury and even in one or two cases death of one of the two loons that was fighting. You know, there aren't unlimited available territories um, for loons, so um, the birds are competing for the, mm -hmm. the few vacancies that remain. Uh, it wasn't a problem we had to think about 20 years ago. Scientists with the VCE say that a thriving loon population needs clean lakes, healthy shorelines, and a good food base. And all of those things are present here in Vermont. Over 80 pairs of loons have attempted to nest in recent years. But that is not enough to ensure long-term success. Along with the increase in the loon population is an increase in their interactions with humans. We've done our job. The loons are back. We've changed our name. We're now the Vermont Loon Conservation Project. We're, we're no longer the Vermont Loon Recovery Project. Um, so that always begs the question, are we ready to pack up and leave and move on? For some species, you can do that with. Um, for loons, though, their habitat overlaps almost entirely with our recreational habitat. We like to, where we like to boat, where we like to picnic. Um, and so there's always, gonna, there's always this sort of conflict or potential for conflict. They're on reservoirs that are going to go up and down. So for at least half of our sites out there in the state, we're going to need some sort of management, whether it's nest warning signs or whether it's the rafts, or at least keeping tabs on them a little, little more closely. The group currently has placed a number of signs on lakes around the state, indicating loon nesting areas and asking people not to disturb them. Raising awareness has also raised a sense of protectiveness in many places. This pond is pretty well utilized by a lot of fishermen. There's a fisherman just coming in here. And yet these loon have been able to bring off youngsters over several years. And uh, although it's a small pond and lots of people fishing here, it's amazing that with these signs that they put up, people, um, they basically feel that they need to protect these birds. And so I've never seen harassment, uh, and the loons have been successful. The Vermont Loon Conservation Project continues to get calls about loons in distress or stuck on lakes or ponds that aren't big enough for them. Despite that, the species as a whole is thriving in Vermont. Loons are, are special just because they're so easy to become part of our lives. Protecting a special bird and preserving Vermont's natural environment for generations to come. In Killington, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. The rebound of the common loon is a wonderful story. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for native pollinators. Pollinators are in decline, and the reasons vary, but there are things we can all do to help. Across the Fence spoke with one of Vermont's pollinator experts about what's happening and what steps we can each take to help pollinators survive. We're definitely hearing a lot about pollinators, and it's really good, and it's really great. I'm really glad that the public is now becoming aware of what's going on with the pollinators. 
80% of global plants are dependent upon pollination services, insect pollination services. So imagine if we lost 80% of our species, what would, what would we have? And it wouldn't be just about we humans, but the whole biodiversity of all, think of all of um, the wildlife that is dependent upon food production and, um, and the pollinators themselves are actually food. Most of our birds in there uh, will feed their babies uh, larvae stage uh, pollinators. So think of the whole bird population as if they didn't, if we didn't have the pollinators, if we didn't have the insect population, we would not have and the scale just continues to go up. Our biodiversity would just die. And at this point, our knowledge of what all of our quantity, our reduction in the diversity and amount of pollinators is just really being studied. We're just at the tip of the iceberg of learning what's going on, but everyone is definitely recognizing that they're under threats. The most obvious threats are pesticide use and our habitat fragmentation and just um, disruption, destroying of um, habitat. How could a decline in pollinators affect Vermonters? Let's talk about um, our farm here, Riverberry Farm. Without pollinators, um, our strawberry production would be uh, pretty abysmal. We wouldn't have much for strawberries. Uh, same with our raspberries. And then some of our um, crops, you know, like we were talking about the tomatoes, um, we definitely rely upon pollinators. We just open up the sides of the greenhouse and hope for the bumblebees to come in and, and help out with the pollination in there. Um, certainly with our eggplants and our peppers, with our melons, without melons, our squash plants. Um, all of the squash family is dependent upon a specific uh, bee. It's a squash bee, it's a native bee. It's not something we introduce or manage. It's something we need to have in the landscape so that we can get um, all of our squashes, both the summers and winter squashes. Um, so yeah, we wouldn't actually be able to have much food production if we didn't have more pollinators. So it's important on our farm that we try to maintain habitat. We're trying to maintain habitat within 300 feet of every portion of our farm because that's what we consider a reasonable flying distance for bees. So, you know, some can go several miles, but some can only go a short distance. So we're working to try to create this whole mosaic, um, sort of corridors and patches of um, habitat within our farm. What does pollinator habitat look like? So when you're talking about pollinator habitat, and like almost any sort of, um, you know, when you talk about the ecological services of any animal, you immediately get into the habitat needs, which would be then, there's kind of like three major prongs of that. There's their food, their water, and their shelter. Most native bees are ground nesting, so they like loose, pliable, like sandy or light soils. Um, if you don't have loose, pliable, open, bare ground, you can consider putting in a sandbox, creating a sandbox, maybe 12 to 18 inches deep, and you know, just pick your length, your size of it, and uh, put it in a spot where it doesn't look like a kid's sandbox, because <laughs> um, you really don't want ground nesting bees um, interacting with people. They're generally not super aggressive. They're, most of them are solitary. They nest um, individually. Bumblebees will have more complex nesting sites, and they're really attracted to like mouse dens, um, old mouse dens, or any kind of cavities. The other 20, 30 percent of native bees are going to be looking for hollow stemmed um, or pithy stemmed uh, plants like raspberries, elderberry, uh, sumac. Um, so keeping a lot of those native wild areas. Anything else that you want people to know about what the problem is or what the solution might look like? I think it's really exciting, the idea of people getting out and just starting looking, paying attention. Um, it's like, what, instead of taking this attitude towards insect, you know, what is that insect, and I, want it, I don't want it in my landscape, it's like, what is that insect, and what's it doing? Huh, I wonder if it's actually pollinating that plant, or it, see it nibbling on a leaf. What is that pollinator, what is that plant? Is that a native insect, and is it eating a little bit of my native plant, and it's getting nourishment, that's keeping it alive. T changing our aesthetic about our landscape um, and thinking of it as a habitat, habitat not just for us, but habitat for all kinds of organisms, will be such a change in our attitude that we will learn to love looking at the life that we create in our landscape. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.